Uh, we have Charlie Clark. I think he is known and loved by many people on this uh, on this presentation. You've you've read his his work for for quite a few years. Uh, he's a journalist and a historian with a focus on, on Arlington. Uh, he worked for a number of organizations, including the Washington Post, Time Life Books, the Congressional Quarterly. He's uh, and now he's uh, uh, writes a column every week for the Falls Church uh, News Press. Uh, I'm sure many of you follow that weekly, Our Man in Arlington. Uh, he's written a number of books, uh, including The Lost Arlington County. And the book that we're list talk listening, um, learning about today is George Washington Park Custis, A Rarefied Life, at, uh, a rarefied life in America's fam First Family. So uh, it's a treat for us to have you, Charlie. Um, again, many people know and recognize your work, so we're anxious to hear all about George Washington's grandson. Charlie? All right, delighted to be here. Hope that works out. Everybody can see everything fine. Uh, we're gonna talk about a, a man who is important in both Arlington and on the national stage too. Uh, George Washington Park Custis, uh, born uh, 1781, died 1857. He lived a unique and impactful life. Uh, he, of course, was raised at Mount Vernon by George and Martha Washington. But he also, uh, he knew the first 15 presidents. He attended every inauguration in his lifetime, except the very first one when he was only 18 years old. He, he's best known for having conceived uh, Arlington House which was built with both uh, free and, and slave labor on the shores of the Potomac in the new capital city. And his daughter married Robert E. Lee, which is uh, the king, was Custis was Lee's father-in-law. And that's why, uh, because of all the drama in the Civil War, that Arlington House uh, became, uh, the land became uh, Arlington Cemetery. Now Custis shows up in nearly every biography of George Washington and every biography of Robert E. Lee as the, uh, a kind of a cameo, uh, kind of a cardboard character. And there had been no such uh, full-length biography of him until uh, about three years ago when I set to work to put, to put this out. There is uh, some biographies of his sister, Nellie Custis, who was uh, also raised at Mount Vernon. He was close with her. Uh, I think there was a demand for female protagonists, which is, which is as it should be. Okay. So this allowed me uh, to produce this, this first full-length biography of him and it, because the timing was right for a modernization of the treatment of the all-important issue of slavery and the National Park Service, which runs Arlington House today, uh, had received a, a large donation from uh, David Rubenstein to uh, modernize this exhibit on slavery. They took about two years to do that. And then because of the pandemic, the reopening was postponed, but it uh, reopened last June and I got to attend some of the earlier. Uh, and uh, I highly recommend that you all go, go to Arlington House to see the more modernized exhibit. And, uh, but I, uh, this allowed me to, um, for the first time, sort of shine a camera on Cuss himself. And uh, I'll let you know what I learned in just a second. So uh, this is Arlington House as it looks today. So Custis uh, was the grandson of Martha Washington. And remember Martha had a first husband named Daniel Park Custis who died just a, two, three years into their marriage in the 1750s. They had two children, Jack, uh, John Park Custis and uh, Martha Park Custis. She dies in uh, teenage uh, years too. So uh, uh, Jackie uh, and uh, his sister Martha were raised at Mount Vernon, uh, adopted by George Washington and uh, with, it, with their, their mother. Uh, and then Jackie dies uh, right after the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, having married Eleanor Calvert. There she is on the right there. Eleanor was a, uh, an heiress from uh, Prince George's County, uh, descendant of the Lord of Baltimore. And uh, she had four children and they all have the name Park. You gotta remember that because that helps them claim their inheritance. So the, uh, there's uh, Elijah Park Custis and Martha Park Custis and, and Eleanor Park Custis who's known as Nellie and then George Washington Park Custis is, is the youngest. 
So after Jackie dies, uh, George Washington and Martha adopt the grands, her grandson, uh, Ann Nellie, and they are raised in Mount Vernon. The older children are raised uh, out in Fairfax County. So um, uh, I'll show you where uh, Custis was born uh, at Mount Airy, which is also where his parents were married. Uh, it's uh, uh, near Upper Marlboro. Uh, it's a state park now. And uh, to take this picture, I had to sneak onto the property because of COVID restrictions, but I hope I acted responsibly. Uh, so then Custis uh, is raised as, a, as an aristocrat at Mount Vernon. Uh, and you can tell one of the signs of it is that they, he and Nellie had their portraits painted by some of the most prominent portraitists uh, in the colonies and in England uh, in the 1780s and 90s. And uh, uh, the most famous one of these portraits was uh, by Edward Savage. I'm about uh, seven years to finish it after they posed uh, uh, and, uh, in, in New York City. But you can see there's George Washington Park Custis on the left and he's uh, got his hand on a globe. And I like to attribute that to uh, uh, being a sign of that they had great hopes for, for him. And the engravings of this portrait were, were distributed around the country. So this was really the, uh, what made George Washington Park Custis a household name in the uh, young American society. Uh, and uh, Martha Washington absolutely doted on her, her grandson, George Washington Park Custis, who was called Wash, and he was also called Tub, sort of as a joke. And as he got older, he was called Washington. George Washington himself doted on Nellie Custis, his, his uh, step-granddaughter. And uh, let's see. They set up uh, a succession of tutors for Nellie and uh, George Washington Park Custis out at Mount Vernon. And if you go to Mount Vernon today, you can see the uh, North Garden House, which is where Washington's secretary, Tobias Lear, tutored uh, Washi, the young Washi, and he had a couple others uh, that came and go, came and went. Uh, but here's the thing, Washi was not a very good student. And when they were in Philadelphia, uh, he attended a precursor to what is today the University of Pennsylvania as kind of a prep school. His, uh, he, he only did average there. He, he then was sent to uh, the College of Nassau, which uh, is today Princeton University, College of New Jersey, I should say, sorry. And uh, he was uh, kicked out of there for reasons that only became clear in the uh, 20th century, it had to do with some kind of vague misbehavior. And so George Washington uh, uh, was, always frustrated by uh, the lack of performance by uh, Washi in college. He, he, was, he sent him then to St. John's College, which is still running in Annapolis, Maryland. And uh, again, he got distracted by uh, wine, women, and song, I guess. And uh, he dropped out of that. And there, there's a huge exchange of correspondence between George Washington and the headmaster of presidents of these Back then, these colleges were religiously oriented, uh, Princeton and St. John's, and expressing the frustration, Washington also wrote to his, his relatives, uh, Custis's uh, new stepfather, David Stewart, who married his widowed mother, and uh, some others. And so I, I hoped in my book to have assembled the, the, the most comprehensive account of all those exchanges it's that they have been done before. So Washi then draw, is sent home from St. John's and uh, is back at Mount Vernon. And it was uh, a big year in 1799. There's, uh, uh, these are portraits of him uh, from so within years of that time. Uh, his sister Nellie gets married in February of 1799. And then George Washington gives her and her new husband, the land for uh, what becomes Woodlawn Plantation, which is within eyesight of Mount Vernon. And uh, war is threatened by France with Napoleon on the rise. And so the, uh, the new America, United States has to put together a new army and George Washington as in retirement as president has made the uh, commander in chief of this alleged new army. And uh, 
George Washington arranges uh, through correspondence for uh, Washi uh, that as a uh, 18 or so year old to uh, be uh, made a coronet in the new army. And he even arranged for him to have some fancy uh, uniforms. Uh, but as, as you all know, that war uh, never, never occurred. But Washi uh, became, you know, as an aristocrat uh, in Virginia Gentry, he knew that he was going to inherit a lot of property. And that may have had something to do with his, his uh, laziness at college. And uh, so it, the key dates uh, in 1799, December, George Washington dies. And in his will for later, when Washi becomes uh, of age, uh, he in inherits uh, about 1,200 acres of, an of land, which today is part of Arlington, Virginia. Martha Washington dies in May of 1802. And in her will, uh, Washi inherits uh, uh, more objects, uh, Ch China and the bed on which Washington died and some books. Uh, Washington's, George Washington's books were uh, inherited by uh, Bushrod Washington. And then there were some auctions and all four of this, the Custis uh, heirs uh, were able to purchase some more artifacts from Mount Vernon. Uh, and Washi, uh, you'll hear about a couple, uh, well, at least one key one of those later. And so uh, that's when uh, Custis um, took to uh, conceiving the building of Arlington House. Now, Arlington House was originally going to be called Mount Washington. That only lasted a few months. Uh, I think there was other things being named that in honor of George Washington. And uh, he hired a, a very reputable uh, British ar architect uh, named George Hadfield, who had designed, he'd worked on the U.S. Capitol, and he had designed some of the D.C. Uh, agency and courthouse buildings. And... Uh, uh, he set himself up. Uh, the, the, the house uh, was started in 1802, and it took 16 years to build. And he lived on the property in, in these uh, old uh, temporary buildings that were already there when he arrived. And he, he imported slave laborers and some uh, so free craftsmen to build it. And, and he lived uh, in the middle part of the house at first, and then the wings were added. So the only thing missing from Custis's life as he set himself up as a Potomac side gentleman was uh, a bride. And uh, here he, in 1804 in July, he married Molly Fitzhugh, Mary uh, called Molly, who uh, had been raised in the Chatham Plantation in Fredericksburg, which you can visit today still, and in Old Town Alexandria at a house on Orinoco Street which her father owned, and you'll hear more about that in a minute, too. And she, uh, she brought some enslaved persons, too. So uh, I should mention that as part of, uh, well, I'll get to that in a sec. Here is the, their marriage certificate from July 6, 1804. And interestingly, I, to get permission to print this in the book, I had to get the permission of both the Library of Virginia, which owns it, and the, as a vital record, and the Arlington clerk of the court, Paul Ferguson, whom I know. So it wasn't very hard to get his permission, but. Uh, and then Molly, the other thing that Molly brings to the marriage is her cousin, acquaintanceship with her cousin, William uh, Meade, who would later become the Bishop of Virginia. And he was known as an Episcopal or Anglican church reformer. And he was inspired to go into the uh, ministry by visiting Arlington House and, and seeing some of Custis's book collections, and they would correspond in later life, and they were both active in the American Colonization Society, which I'll discuss a little bit later, too. So uh, this is a, just a, a picture that shows you around Custis at around the time of uh, the early uh, years of Arlington House. He, he set himself up as a uh, uh, agricultural reformer and as an orator which I'll get to uh, uh, he uh, here's the way his daughter described him uh, you know uh, unlike uh, George Washington and Robert E. Lee who were sort of handsome and statuesque and duty driven you know I call Custis was short and beak-nosed verbose paunchy and playful 
In other words, he was a little more approachable. But uh, here's the way his daughter described him in, in the memoir that they produced. Mr. Custis was of medium height and well-formed, his complexion fair and somewhat florid, his eyes light and expressive of great kindliness of nature, his voice full, rich, and melodious, his deportment graceful and winning, his courtesy to strangers extremely cordial, and his affection for his friends warm and abiding. Uh, so you gotta remember that he, he possessed a voice that in this age before microphones could enthrall hundreds of people in, in a room or a public square, which he did on every year on Washington's birthday and at political rallies where he would endorse uh, a lot of military candidates, namely Andrew Jackson and uh, Zachary Taylor. He also, uh, he weighed in as an essayist, an orator on the top tier issues of the early uh, 19th century, which includes domestic economic independence, farming innovation, collapse of the Federalist Party, the advent of the steamship and the railroad, the protection of Irish Catholic immigrants, and the first federal benefits for veterans of both the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. So uh, Custis also, he held uh, sheep shearings on, on his property and neighbors such as John Mason, the son of George Mason who lived on what is today Roosevelt Island and other notables from around the area would bring their newly bred sheep to compete in, to, to, to judges. And uh, also, when the War of 1812 uh, hit, uh, uh, when the British arrived in 1814, uh, even though the Federalists were upset that the Madisonians had declared war on the British, uh, he volunteered to fight for no pay, and he actually fought, uh, fired a shot in the Battle of Bladensburg, the battlefield which you can go visit today in suburban Maryland. Uh, his agricultural uh, reforms, uh, his efforts to breed a new type of sheep, which he called Arlington Improved, uh, are still recognized by today's USDA. If you go on the website, you can see a little mention of George Washington Park Custis, and he was trying to come up with a domestic alternative to the more popular uh, Merino sheep. So now, uh, the other mission of George Washington Park Custis was among the first commemorations of, of uh, George Washington. So uh, let's see. Uh, in 1815, he got started by taking a couple of Revolutionary War veterans on a steamship down the Potomac to Pope's Creek, which you can go visit today. And that was the site of what was called Wakefield Plantation, which is the birthplace of George Washington. And they rolled a, a stone and set it up uh, there to commemorate. It was, it's, this is considered the first stone, first commemoration of, of, of the birthplace, of, of, uh, first commemoration really of George Washington, the first Washington Monument. Now, Custis inherited as part of his, uh, Martha Washington's will, the Custis plantations down on the Pamunkey River. And that's east of Richmond, uh, sort of near Williamsburg. And I went, I went down there to visit both, both sites. And this is an engraving from the 1880s from a Civil War uh, veteran's uh, account of a visit to the site of it. And the thing to remember about, uh, there were about 130 or 40 enslaved persons working for Custis on these two plantations. One was called Roman Cock. Originally, it was changed later to Roman Coke uh, for matters of taste. And uh, the other one was called White House. And White House had been in the Custis family and then the Washington family. It's where uh, George and Martha Washington were married in, in the 1750s. And the 130 enslaved persons who worked there uh, were the most, that operation was far more profitable than the operations at Arlington House where about 60 or 60 to 70 enslaved persons worked. And in, in Arlington House, they produced mostly for the, uh, the, ki the kitchen gardens and, and uh, it was down on the uh, Southern uh, plantations where the uh, commercial uh, product was produced. So here uh, I wanted to remind people of uh, uh, this unpleasantness. This is a slave inventory of both Custis's plantations on the Pamunkey River. And you, if you study it in the book, you may not have a chance now, you'll see that the livestock, this is a, a ledger of uh, 
uh, livestock and then the human beings that are enslaved are combined. And this is how, how the measure of, of, of productivity. Now, a key visit uh, in Custis's life was the 1824 and 25 uh, grand tour of the Marquis de Lafayette, who was invited by President James Monroe to return from France after the French Revolution had subsided and uh, spend about 18 months uh, traveling by carriage and steamship uh, around uh, the North and Southern states. He was very popular in Alexandria, well, well received there. And he spoke on the floor of the uh, Congress too. And he spent a, a very wonderful evening at Arlington House uh, at a, a grand dinner where all of Custis's relatives came and a lot of VIPs from across the river from the military and uh, congressional establishment. And at this dinner, he and Lafayette continued what was an ongoing debate they had about slavery because Lafayette was against slavery and he made no secret of it. You can see it in the accounts of his trip. And he would challenge Custis and they quizzed each other about and debated the American Colonization Society and its agenda of whether uh, American Blacks should be deported, freed and deported to Africa. And uh, it was during that visit that Custis, he, he accompanied Lafayette also out to Mount Vernon and to Fort McHenry and down to the battlefield of Yorktown, uh, that Custis got the idea that he could write and he uh, decided to produce, he would spend the day with Lafayette and then he would go home at night and write notes because he wasn't taking notes by day. And, and he produced what were called Conversations of Lafayette. And originally the pan was to do, uh, I think 25 or so, uh, but according to the newspaper of the time that published a lot of them, but uh, I think it's all about 16 that survive and they were in the Alexandria Gazette and, and then the National Intelligencer newspaper. And the editor of that National Intelligence newspaper was William Seton, who was a Federalist, I mean, a, a Jeffersonian, even though he didn't share Custis's Federalist views, they were good friends. And Seton was a networker. He kept, uh, he knew Custis was an important uh, person to cultivate. Seton, by the way, later became uh, the uh, edit, uh, mayor of the District of Columbia. Now, in uh, 1830, one a major event happens in the uh, Custis family, and that is the the courtship and then the marriage uh, between the daughter Mary and uh, and Robert E. Lee. Now, Mary, I should backtrack, was born in 1808, uh, and she uh, the Custis has had uh, about three other children who died in infancy. One of them, uh, a son named Edward, lived the longest. I think he may have lived 18 months or so, but the rest uh, were stillborn. So uh, Ma Mary uh, Custis uh, was raised as, as an only child. And uh, she knew Robert E. Lee uh, when they were small uh, because Robert E. Lee's father, who was Light Horse Harry Lee, the uh, U.S. Congressman and Revolutionary War hero, uh, was renting uh, the house on Orinoco Street in Old Town, Alexandria, that Lee was raised in after he was born down in Stafford County. Uh, I'm sorry, in Westmoreland County, it's Strat Stratford Hall, I misspoke there. Uh, so she, she would say later that she saw young Robert E. Lee during Lafayette's 1824 visit to Old Town, Alexandria. And so uh, they had a, a, a formal wedding in the parlor at Arlington House with uh, Lee's West Point uh, grooms, uh, classmates as groomsmen. And she had some high society people, including her, her own relatives there uh, in, the, uh, in the parlor. And that parlor, I'm gonna raise, raise it again in a minute too, but in another context. This is the home uh, on Orinoco Street. Uh, it's on the market today, by the way. It just sold two years ago for like 4.7 million. And then they put it back on the market. This is where Custis and his bride, Molly, were married. It's right around the corner from Christ Church, which they also attended. And this is where Lee was raised. There's some debate going on about the uh, accuracy of the plaques there, which I'll get into if you really, if you really want to. Now, uh, 1836, another important event happens in Custis's role as kind of a curator of American monuments that 
there's a feeling that the mother of George Washington, Mary Ball Washington, has been neglected and that her grave uh, it, it, it needs to be uh, better marked and commemorated. So uh, uh, George Washington, of course, had built her a house uh, in downtown Fredericksburg when she died in, in 1789. And so uh, it, it was in 1836 that Custis uh, and some other relatives arranged for President Andrew Jackson, who was his friend, uh, to travel down to Fredericksburg. And uh, the enslaved uh, valet of Custis uh, brought with him the tent that George Washington used during Revolutionary War battles. And they erected the tent there and 15,000 people gathered in what today is the historic district in Fredericksburg. It's right there at Kenmore Plantation. The man who then owned Kenmore Plantation, uh, Samuel Gordon, donated the land for this monument to uh, Mary Ball Washington, which you, you can see today. Cus has had a big role and he spoke at that event too, as did the president. This is the battlefield tent that I spoke of. You can see it today in, in Philadelphia at the Museum of the American Revolution. Custis was the curator of this. Of course, the curatorial sciences were inexact in that day. And uh, I'm sure it got uh, a lot of damage was done to it. He talks about that in later letters over the years. And there, there are actually several portions to it. You, you can see another portion of it down at the uh, Yorktown battlefield owned by the National Park Service. Also important locally for we Arlingtonians is that uh, Custis had a pretty important role in, in the local area. I mean, he, he was appointed repeatedly as a justice of the peace uh, when the retrocession uh, of uh, Alexandria County, which included Arlington back then in the, in the 19th century, uh, was debated in the 1830s and then executed by an act of Congress in, the, in 1846 and 47. Custis was uh, put in charge of the committee to go down and lobby in, in Richmond to uh, get final approval. And he had been against retrocession back in 1804. He was on record on a pamphlet he sent to Congress. But uh, there's complicated issues about the reasons for retrocession. They might have a little bit to do with slavery, but it more had to do with the failure of the federal government to fund buildings in uh, the Virginia side of the Potomac that led a lot of uh, Alexandrians to, to want to be severed from DC. So uh, Custis, uh, in addition, was, had built one of the most important mills. Uh, there was a, a precursor to it uh, as far back as 1808. Uh, and today you can see the site at uh, Columbia Pike and South Columbus Street behind a, a car repair shop uh, where there's a very powerful waterfall you can, on Four Mile Run. And uh, this is an engraving of that Custis's mill that he built in 1836, a more modern and powerful grist mill and saw mill. And uh, this is a Civil War uh, troops passing by it. And uh, it was uh, torn down or burned, I guess, by troops and uh, rebuilt in a much more technologically sophisticated version in the 1880s. Uh, beginning in the 1880s by uh, John Barcroft. And the Barcroft mill stood until the 1830s, at which time it was, I think, burned down too. So here's a shot of Custis uh, as he's aging. And uh, I wanted to make it clear that by then, you know, he's, he's got a, quite a reputation. He has made trips uh, to New England. He made a famous trip in 1845 that got covered by a lot of uh, newspapers. And he went up to uh, New England to Boston area and saw the battlefields at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. And he, he complained that the Bunker Hill monuments were insufficient and that the, some of the battlefield was being uh, taken over for uh, housing units, which he complained about. Uh, when the plans for a monument to George Washington got going in the 1830s, uh, Custis offered Arlington House as the site for it, but it was instead set up, on, as you know, on the mall downtown. Um, he also um, became kind of a consultant to a lot of the painters of the day, uh, the sons of uh, Charles Wilson Peel, uh, Titian Peel and Rembrandt Peel uh, corresponded with Custis regularly for advice on uniforms and uh, the appearance of George Washington. The George Washington biographies, su such biographers, such as Jared Parks, I'm sorry, Jared Sparks, 
president of Harvard before that, and Washington Irving uh, consulted with Custis, and a lot of all the autograph seekers uh, wrote to him. And I like to sort of think of Custis as sort of the zealot of the 19th century, that he seemed to have been present uh, at so many events. He, he was there at both cornerstone layings of the Capitol when he was a boy, the original one in 1793, and then when they expanded the Capitol in 1851 and dedicated the, the cornerstone, he, he was there. Uh, Custis, uh, as early as 1812, was invited to be a member of the American Antiquarian Society, which was also included John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Noah Webster. He was rejected by the Society of the Cincinnati, which is where the uh, Revolutionary War Officers Organization includes the 13 colonies plus France, and they have state uh, branches. And, uh, uh, but he wanted to get in on the strength of being a Marylander, son of his father, who was an aide de camp to George Washington at the Battle of Yorktown, but the society did not buy that. Uh, and um, he did not join the Masons. Now, maybe you all know there's a new book coming out on George Washington as a Mason, and George Washington is probably the most famous of the members of this Masonic temple, and that's why Alexandria built that George Washington Masonic monument. But um, uh, there's a slight mystery why George Washington Park Custis never joined the Masons. He, he did donate a lot of artifacts to them and corresponded with them. And one theory is uh, there was a little bit of a scandal during his uh, year at Mount Vernon after he uh, was kicked out of college, uh, where he was arrested for stealing silver spoons from Gadsby's Tavern. And there's some legal documents that indicate that he was a no-show in court but there's no indications of the resolution of the case. So it's, you can guess that maybe some higher powers in, intervene. So it, beginning in the 1830s and then in, in 20s, 30s, and then into the 40s, uh, Custis wrote a lot of plays. He wrote several, uh, a dozen or more plays. And they were usually a patriotic themes. They uh, had, he had, one, several on the Indians of Pocahontas, and then this one that I show this poster, which is uh, uh, the Indian prophecy, and that's based on a, a story of, uh, that in eight, 1770, George Washington and his physician friend, uh, James Craig, returned to the battlefields of the French and Indian War, where Washington first made his name as a hero in what is today West Virginia and Kanawha. And they were reunited with uh, a Native American chief who had recalled that back in 1750s, uh, when he had encountered this uh, white horseman who was seemed immune to their weaponry and he predicted that someday he would lead a mighty empire. And that's how, the, that's the Indian prophecy that Custis made into a play. His plays were performed all up and down the East Coast in Boston, Philadelphia, uh, and down in Columbia, South Carolina, and at Washington's own National Theater, which got going in 1836. He wrote about the railroads. They had a, a life-size railroad uh, engine on stage. Uh, he, he wasn't universally uh, uh, recognized as, as a quality playwright, but uh, I must say that as a business, they, they were uh, quite successful. He also took to painting. And here uh, you can see his paintings at Arlington House and at the Masonic Temple in Alexandria too. Uh, even his daughter will confess that his talent wasn't really in the uh, beauty and formation of the imagery, but more the, the detail, which he researched very, uh, very uh, ex exhaustively. And that's in this painting, which you can see at Arlington House, the Battle of Monmouth, uh, you can see a small image of um, Molly Pitcher, who's the legendary uh, female combatant there uh, in, in the left. And here's another example of Custis's uh, work in equestrian figure. And he also did a self-portrait, which you can see at Arlington House too. And there, it's funny, they were displayed in the US Capitol and at this DC City Hall, but apparently some senators complained that he weren't high quality. So they were removed from the Capitol, which offended Custis. So that, let's, this brings us to the most topical aspect of the book, uh, which is Custis's handling of slavery, uh, it really became a national issue, both because of his connection to the Washington family 
the Mount Vernon uh, slaves and the, what are called the Dower slaves, which is Martha Washington's own slaves that were sent to uh, Arlington House and, and on the Pamunkey River. But also because when Robert E. Lee married into the family, uh, his uh, subsequent ownership of the, the slaves uh, with his wife, his wife really inherited the property, uh, became a big issue. And in later years and decades afterwards was you know a little bit exaggerated Lee's role in it. I mean, it was really, Arlington House is basically a Custis project. Lee was not there as often. He was on the road as a military guy. So uh, but this is a, uh, what, what the French would call a laissez-passer. Uh, it, it's a printer's proof of the passes that the enslaved persons at Arlington House would have to carry and it would have to be signed by Custis or, or an overseer in order for the, the enslaved person to go run an errand and say in Old Town Alexandria. I just thought that was a very vivid image of what life was like there. And, and in the book, I talk about how Custis apparently was pretty lenient in giving these passes. Uh, among the most notable enslaved persons, and again, there's a lot more detail at Arlington House, uh, but Selena Gray and her husband Thornton are known, she's known best uh, as the uh, chambermaid to Mrs. Lee uh, and who rescued the uh, George Washington artifacts when the Civil War was started and the Union troops were arriving to confiscate Arlington House. She said she took them down to Richmond. That's her husband Thornton and they were one of two enslaved couples who the Custis is permitted to marry in the parlor, the same parlor of Arlington House that uh, Robert E. Lee and uh, Mary Custis uh, married in. Uh, another notable with a real Arlington connection is uh, James Parks on the right. That's his father on the left, Lawrence Parks, who was drawn as drawn by Mary Custis Lee. And uh, in the book, I talk about how their, their treatment, uh, how did, did Custis case free, mostly through selling them to an abolitionist. And the, the, yes, these slaves, uh, enslaved persons were taught to read by Mary and Molly Custis, uh, not so much by uh, George Washington Park Custis. And uh, James Parks on the right there has this distinction of he was born uh, into slavery at Arlington House in the 1850s and lived until 1929. And he continued to work there at Arlington House, eventually for Arlington Cemetery. And uh, his descendants are still around in Arlington today. He's quite a story. And he talked about what it was like under Custis too. I quote that in the book. But here's where we get to the probably the most important uh, episode in Custis's handling of, of slavery. Uh, there's pretty good evidence. There was oral tradition and then some, some more solid evidence that I deal with in the book that Custis uh, did have uh, sexual relations with an enslaved woman who came over from Mount Vernon named uh, Ariana Carter. And this would have been around 1803, right, right after he started building Arlington House and before he married. And uh, the birth of the daughter, Mar Mariah Carter Syfax, uh, in that year, um, uh, figured out, figured later uh, in around 1821, uh, she married uh, Charles Syfax. Uh, another enslaved uh, person at Arlington House, and they were permitted uh, to be married in the parlor, uh, which was unusual. And in 1826, she was manumitted with her son, not, not her children, not, not uh, Charles, he, he stayed on in the enslaved workforce. And she was given 17 acres of land uh, in Arlington House, which is today around where, uh, Fort Myer is today, uh, where the uh, Henderson Hall and all that is. And uh, that's the why the Syfax family is so important in Arlington today. They trace their ancestry, not, not just to her, but to, even further back too. And uh, the, the final evidence for that, uh, besides the rumors in the, printed in the papers at the times of, of more than one mulatto child in, in the uh, workforce at Arlington House, there was definitely a lot of gossip about it. And then the census uh, records show me uh, mixed race children. They called them mulattoes at that time period. But the final evidence is an interview that uh, Mariah Syfax gave in the 1880s to a Kansas newspaper, which I quote, in which she says that Custis called her in and told her that he was her father and that, uh, uh, that she had got along very well with Mrs. Lee and that they were sisters. 
So we'll see in the future whether this gets incorporated into the literature on Mar um, Martha Washington, because this, this makes Martha Washington the great grandmother of Mariah Syfax. And here is the grave that Mariah Syfax is entombed in along with some other members of that family. And that's uh, out in Suitland, Maryland. I took a trip out there uh, last fall. Uh, so we finally get to um, the years of dotage uh, where uh, Custis uh, writes his will and uh, he puts a little bit of a time bomb in it uh, where he says that he, he writes the will in 17, I'm sorry, 1853, and I, 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 I uh, reprinted it in the book, that uh, Robert E. Lee is his main executor, there are other executors, and that uh, all the uh, enslaved persons will be freed within five years. But the other parts of the will proclaim that the seven grandchildren, which is Robert E. Lee and Mary Lee's children, are supposed to have $10,000 each. And so that when Lee tries to be the executor of this will, he feels torn uh, about whether uh, he can really free these slaves uh, at the same time that he can uh, make the plantations profitable. So he, he dilly dallies and uh, Lee doesn't uh, free these slaves. He does it by name as an inventory in December of 1862 in the middle of the Civil War, right after the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg. So then Custis um, dies in October of 1857 of pneumonia and his funeral brought thousands of people to the shores of the Potomac at Arlington House, military units, and uh, it had press coverage all over the world. And uh, he uh, was, people were reminded again that he used to be important. Uh, he was considered in later life, I think, to be a little old fashioned, you know, where he was still singing revolutionary era songs and wearing uh, knee pants uh, and a ruffled shirts and everything in, into the 1850s. So he, he wasn't what you'd call fashionable. Um, now, when after he dies, uh, there's big debates about whether to, uh, the, the future of his uh, enslaved persons and by then, the American Colonization Society had, had faded somewhat. It had been attacked by uh, Frederick Lloyd Douglas and earlier in the 1830s, I, I should have mentioned that earlier, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist editor, had attacked Custis personally for their activity in the uh, American Colonization Society. We can talk about that more in the end. So in the q and I should say. So after Custis dies, uh, here he is, his grave, as you can see it, behind the administration building at Arlington House. And that oak tree uh, was uh, a problem as way back in the, in the 19th century too. And it's, his wife's grave is to the right and his grave is to the left there. Um, uh, Benson Lossing had made friends with Custis in the 1850s. Now he was a well-known writer and archivist and sketch artist, and he had written uh, battlefield uh, histories of the Revolutionary War, and he'd done a, a, a very detailed inventory of Mount Vernon, and at Arlington House, he published uh, a long description of uh, Arlington House in Harper's Magazine in 1853. He made friends with Custis, and there's all this correspondence between them where Lossing is uh, trying to encourage Custis to finish his memoir, of what, what it was like to be George Washington's step-grandson and grow up at Mount Vernon. And uh, Custis was dilly down a little bit because he wanted to write his plays and do his painting. But, uh, and so uh, after Custis dies, Lossing then proceeds right away to work with Mary Lee to edit the book. And uh, that book is finally published in uh, 1860. And uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, sketches of Revolutionary War personages, a lot of personal accounts and descriptions of George Washington. And uh, Custis by this helped continue Custis's fame. Uh, there was a passenger steamer named for him, a Civil War balloon named for him, as well as a waltz and a polka. Uh, let's see, I wanted to, um, this is an example of the kind of material that people would ask for Custis about, you know, what was George Washington's, the best, most accurate portrait of him. And 
this uh, my, we put these together, Trumbull for the figure, Stuart for the head, and Sharples the expression, and you have all of the portrait of, portraiture of Washington. Uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to read the, 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 the final descriptions of Custis. Um, you know, I, I say that in the book that he could hardly have imagined the forces he, uh, he had unleashed uh, after he died. Can you imagine the sting if he had lived to see his son-in-law leading Southern troops in the Civil War? It's no surprise that Custis would mimic his hero, George Washington, in waiting to his death to, uh, to free his, uh, the enslaved people that he owned. And uh, he may have presumed self-servingly that Lee could work miracles in paying for the emancipations by heightening the profitability of the plantations. But, um, but basically, Custis would not have been wanted to have been known for his handling of the, the complicated issue of slavery. He, his main, the central theme of his life, I say, was the Patriots' perpetuation of the fame and memory of George Washington as the sun that never sets. And he preserved, I, I say, to a patriotic optimism to, to the end. And one of his final quotes I say, if in the wildest days, the wildest man that was ever born of woman had been told that the United States of America in the short period of some three score years would become one of the leading powers of the world and would be in a short time, the mistress of the world, he would have pronounced the prophecy an idle dream. And then I wanted to just end before we do Q and A with um, some fun tourist shots. Uh, if you go down to Richmond and, and head east toward the Pamunkey River at West Point is the town, West Point, Virginia we're talking about. I had to distinguish it from West Point, New York in the book because that's where Lee was superintendent, of course. Uh, this is what the, uh, uh, the White House would look like today on your left. It's now a suburban subdivision. And on your right uh, is what the uh, Roman Coke would look like. They're in two different counties, uh, uh, New Kent County and uh, the uh, King William County. Uh, the one on the right is just a, a deserted kind of former railroad yard. But I did have fun down there in New Kent County, uh, visited the St. Peter's Episcopal Church, which is where a lot of Custises went regularly and in the yard, graveyard there is the uh, tomb of the minister of that church who was the one who married George and Martha Washington nearby at, at, at White House and uh, that's it I have a list of the uh, institutions that I visited so I'm delighted now to uh, listen to any Q&A or uh, listen to any commentary too on the talk. Uh, so we have two questions right now Kate Maddows asked she said I understood that the uh, uh, Syfaxes had long asked for reparations for their uh, for their property. Do you know the status of that? Well, yeah, that that came in, I guess, two contexts. The uh, you know after the Civil War or beginning during the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the part of Arlington House was set up as Freeman's Village. And uh, uh, freed laborers there lived there with their own houses and schools and hospitals for about 20 years. And they improved those properties. And so in the 1880s, when the US military wants to take over that land again, uh, they um, uh, arranged to compensate some of the Freeman's village citizenry. Uh, it was negotiated. Um, and uh, John Langston had a role in that too, for whom Lee Highway was just renamed. Now, uh, in terms of the Syfaxes in modern times, uh, you know, there are lots of descendants uh, and they have reunions every year and they've been working with Arlington House on the exhibits. And there's talk of uh, trying to do more research on to prove the relationship between Maria, Mariah Syfax and uh, Custis being uh, her, her father. But in terms of uh, modern day reparations, uh, I haven't heard that, that, that that's what they're, they're part of that movement. There, of course, there is a modern day movement for reparations for descendants of enslaved persons, but I'm not aware of what the Syfax's position on that is, if they have a single position. Thank you, Charlie. By the way, the, the name Syfax is, what, what 
what is the background on that name? Do you have any input on that? Well, the, the patriarch is a William Syfax who shows up in Alexandria in the 1790s. Uh, I don't know the origin of that name. It's Greek. I, I think the, my, my friends, Craig and Doug Syfax, who are modern day Arlingtonians, mentioned that it has a Greek origin, origin I think. But uh, William Syfax is an interesting character too. And, you know, I'm not the Syfax expert. My, my friend, Steve Hammond, is the official historian of the Syfax family who's given talks to in, in oh. the historical society and he and I are friends. And, uh, but he's the one who would, would talk about uh, William Syfax was an early freed uh, black craftsman uh, who made quite a bit of money in Alexandria. And he was the, worked alongside, I think it was next door to uh, William St uh, Stabler, who's uh, the old apothecary shop, which you can still visit today in Old Town. And uh, Stabler and Ledbetter was the name of that business for decades and decades. And I did a lot of good research there. And Alexandria gave me a lot of good receipts uh, from Custis and Lees and Washington's. Nellie and Martha Washington all shopped at uh, the Stabler Ledbetter apothecary. And uh, William Syfax was sort of working alongside them. And uh, he may have influenced, because uh, Stabler was a uh, uh, Quaker. And so he, he uh, ag agreed to uh, free a lot of slaves uh, if somebody else would buy, buy them out buy from the owners. And that's, that's where Custis comes in. Uh, there was on several occasions, he sold uh, enslaved persons to uh, Stabler uh, and uh, on the knowing that they would be uh, manumitted. So. Uh, Esther Williams asked the question, with the ownership of the Palmonkey area and being that Native Americans that were still there, how did the Custis family treat them and were they considered slaves as well? Well, well i tell you, that's a very good question. Uh, I found no, the, the, the headquarters of the Palmonkey tribe is literally a stone's throw from the uh, Roman Coke plantation. And I noticed that on the map. You can see that on a modern day map. So I was guessing that there would be some kind of relationship, but I, I found nothing. And I'll be ready to stand corrected if somebody else digs that up. In fact, I was gonna do that. You know, one thing, not to make excuses, but the pandemic did interrupt some of my research for this book. And I had planned to go back down there. And that was one of the, one thing on my list was I was gonna visit that Pamunkey tribes um, uh, visitor center and uh, uh, ask around about that. So thank you for raising that. And I'll, I might try and do that as a separate little project, so. Maybe you can give us an update, a quick, uh, in our, uh -huh. one of our newsletters, just a quick PS. Um, <laughs> Uh, the question now is, uh, do you think Robert E. Lee would have stayed with the Union Army if Custis had still been alive at the time that Lee made his decision to join the Confederate cause? Well, again, that is an excellent question. Uh, Custis was definitely against secession. And he there's statements from him from the 1830s when there was a nullification crisis where already the southern states were threatening to pull out of the north. And uh, uh, he repeated it uh, in, in several quotes that I have in the book in the 1840s and 50s. So, you know, he, he was close to his son-in-law, uh, but he was in dotage in the 1850s. And, and, and Lee, I even quote Lee kind of mocking his father-in-law. He was very affectionate to him in many uh, letters. And, and, he, and Lee also was very uh, heartbroken at his father-in-law's death and all that. And that's a bit undocumented. Uh, but uh, Lee, you know, was a, 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 and of course Lee's family was divided on whether to fight for the North or the South, you know? So it was such a complicated question that my impression is that Lee was a, a pretty stubborn individualist and that he wouldn't have uh, necessarily obeyed Custis. But I think Custis would have been heartbroken that the South seceded. Uh, Custis put in his will to free his slaves. After he died, how many were freed and how many were not? Well, uh, see, you got to remember that the Emancipation Proclamation kicks in uh, in 18, January of 1863. So Custis, uh, there was about 60 or so in that document that Lee, that uh, inventory that Lee compiled and 
uh, sat on for five years. Uh, he, he probably updated it, but you, you can find that document online. And uh, so I, I basically keep in my head that there was about 200 total, uh, 60 or so, give or take, because, you know, it's a fluid number at Arlington House, 130 to 140 down the Pamunkey River, and that Lee uh, had about 60 or so that he uh, officially freed in December of 1862, and the Emancipation Proclamation kicked in uh, a week later. Vivian, can you scroll down on the questions here so that I can uh, uh, pose a few more? You should be able to click on Q&A and uh, look at some. Oh, yeah, I see you. Okay, I, I can do it from here. Um, what generation is Evelyn Syfax? Do you know, are you familiar with her, Charlie? Yeah, so Evelyn uh, is the mother of my, my friends, uh, Craig and Doug. And Craig are, and Doug are in their 50s or so, maybe early 60s. I don't want to rat on them, but that's a popular age. So she died, I think it's 18, I'm mean, sorry, 1990 or so. And they named, she was an important Arlington educator. And they named the education building after her. They, they named the first one that was across from Washington Liberty High School, where it is now. And then they renamed it over at the new uh, education center. Uh, so um, she lived, I'm guessing, I mean, we could look it up, but I'm guessing she lived from maybe the 20s through the 18, uh, 1980s, Evelyn Syfax. Are the graves of George Washington Park Custis and his wife a part of Arlington National Cemetery uh, administered by the U.S. Army or part of Arlington House run by the National Park Service? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. And I've had to deal with both. Yeah, the, the army runs Arlington Cemetery. And, I, uh, and so uh, they have been over the decades have been, you know, because of the high demand for the honor of burial at Arlington Cemetery, not to be disrespectful, but it does encroach onto more of Arlington County's land. And Custis's property, it was, it was a total of tw about 2,300 acres to begin with. Uh, he, he inherited about 1,100 from his father, Jackie Custis, that became the, the uh, Arlington House um, Hill. Uh, and then the George Washington uh, 1200 acres is more along uh, Columbia Pike area. And uh, the cemetery is growing. They're, they're about to grow again. You know, they tore down the Naval Annex and uh, they're, they're going to uh, uh, expand, uh, put the Air Force Memorial. I've written about this in my column inside of uh, Arlington Cemetery so that you can't visit it without going through their metal detectors like you do with the cemetery and everything. So uh, that, that battle has been going since really since World War I. That's when they built that amphitheater, it was 100 years ago, and uh, you know, realized after World War I that that cemetery had a, it was gonna need a lot more land uh, in the future. So currently it's being maintained, the graves are being maintained by the cemetery? But you're talking about Custis's graves? Custis's graves. The graves of George Washington Park Custis yeah, and yeah, his wife. Yeah, yeah I, I believe that's right, but I'll check on that for you because, um, uh, you know, the Arlington House Park Service staff doesn't have uh, this, this curatorial uh, skill sets to do grave. That, that's done... Uh, you know, it, uh, they have full-time people who work for the Army, Arlington Cemetery. So that, that would be logical to me. But uh, my colleague, Matt Penrod, by the way, who wrote an excellent uh, afterward to my book, I'm very grateful to him. He spent uh, 28 years at Arlington House giving tours on Custis, and he and I sort of helped conceive the project together. Uh, I'll ask him, he'll, he'll know the answer to that, but he never mentioned, you know, uh, there's another volunteer ranger there named Dean DeRosa, who's upset about the fact that the Custis graves are uh, uh, being destroyed by that oak tree. And uh, so he, but there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in trying to get anything done about it. And I'm sure, uh, my guess is that the army has a bigger say than the park service, but I'll check on that for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, did Leaf, did the, no, did uh, Custis free any of his slaves during his lifetime? Yes, he did. That's a, that's a very good question. And I do have a couple examples of that uh, in the book. You know, his wife, uh, Fitzhugh family, he, he inherited uh, a few slaves uh, 
when her father dies and I think it's 1807 maybe and uh, they free a few of them that were that were favorites at the time and and then in the 1820s they free a few more via uh, Edward Stabler so uh, you know it, it seems to have been done uh, based on his attachments and uh, maybe his wife's attachments yeah. rather than on a systematic effort because I mean look Custis was trying to make money off his plantations. You know, there's no uh, getting around that. And so that would be his reluctance. And, you know, the uh, let, let's talk about the American Colonization Society a little bit. It, it, it's, um, it was very mainstream. You know, it, it was set up in 1816 and it went on until the 1850s. Uh, President James Monroe was active in it. So were Bushrod Washington. So were the, the presidents of the uh, main colleges in the U.S., you know, and so... Their idea was that blacks and whites scientifically just couldn't live together. And so that the slave trade for 200 years had been a, a, a big mistake culturally. And so the solution, and we, uh, Bishop William Meade and Mrs. Custis and uh, uh, others of their friends were all active in it, trying to raise money uh, and uh, volunteer blacks to say, we'll give you your freedom, but we're going to ship you to what became Liberia. And the capital of Liberia in Africa today is Monrovia for James Monroe. And I think I say in the book, about 16,000 ended up fulfilling that, going over there. And some of them wrote back to Mrs. Lee from Arlington House to say, we're, we're doing pretty well here. But overall, the mission of it was, was a failure. And when you think about it, you know, slavery starts in 1619 in the U.S., right? So you have uh, people who've been born here for eight or ten generations who have no uh, memory of Africa and, and no desire to go, you know, this is the only place they've known. So it, it, it seems a, a little uh, like it was doomed to fail in my view. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did Maria Syfax and, and Mary Lee know that they shared, shared the same father or did they suspect or is there anything, any insights on that? Well, there's nothing from Mary Lee. And, you know, there's been a lot of uh, written about her. I have a whole biography of her. And that's the subject doesn't even come up. And uh, you got to remember that it would have been considered a little bit shameful and beneath, you know, when, when Thomas Jefferson was revealed by the DNA in the 1990s to have been the, you know, the uh, had relations with Sally Hemings, uh, the counter argument up until then had been that he was too good of a man to, have, to stoop so low kind of argument. And uh, so there's, there's plenty of people who would, might argue, uh, might have argued that, that, uh, uh, but there, the rumors were around uh, in the time period in the 1860s, judging by the news clippings, and it resurfaced, interestingly, in the uh, 1930s. There's an African-American historian named Sterling Brown who was hired by the U.S. government during the New Deal to write a, a, a travel guide to the Washington, D.C. area, and he broached the subject. He said that it is, it is pretty much clear that George Washington Park Custis fathered uh, Mariah Syfax and that people don't want to talk about it. And he was condemned on the floor of the House of Representatives and people thought this is an outrage and insulting. So uh, I couldn't find anything in the Mary Lee literature that would that would say uh, even broach this topic. So uh, Stephen Assen, he's a um, maybe a fan of yours. He said, Charlie, great presentation. <laughs> his question is, I thought George Washington ordered the freeing of his slaves upon his death. Was, then, was that not true of Martha Washington's slaves? You mentioned that her slaves ended up at Arlington House. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the, the Dower, Martha, there were, there were several sets of slaves at Mount Vernon, and some of Martha's uh, uh, enslaved persons were freed a year before she died at, out of fear that if they knew they were soon to be freed, that they might attack her. And so she picked a few that were her favorites. And, uh, you know, Mount Vernon, uh, Mary Thompson is the expert of this out at Mount Vernon. Uh, and it's on the Mount Vernon website too. But the dower slaves, uh, Martha wanted uh, her uh, uh, grandchildren to uh, ha have them to uh, keep the economy of the plantations going. So, yeah, and, and the, oh yeah, my hmm? I'm reminded that the uh, uh, it's a legal issue too because those slaves were owned by Martha's first husband, Daniel Park. So George 
George Washington didn't really have the right to free them. So. Gotcha. Uh, Kate Maddows asks, uh, did you get the impression that George Washington Park Custis struggled with the issue of slavery and changed his views during his lifetime? That's a very good question. He, he, when the abolitionists attacked him for being a backer of the American Colonization Society plan to deport blacks, he uh, got his uh, his feathers all ruffled and. To, you know, said he would defend himself. So he was, he, he, he publicly, I don't think he ever took a position that he was hesitant. But my impression of Custis is that he was, I, I don't want to be simplistic about it, but he was a little bit of a, of a, of a softy. And that, uh, you know, if you read some of these biographies of Robert E. Lee by admirers of Lee, that he, Lee is portrayed as a manly man who know how to knew how to make the slaves more productive and was a better manager when he took over the Custis estate in 1857. He's a better manager than Custis had been because Custis was a poor financial manager. But, um, and then you have the evidence, for example, from James Parks, who's saying that, you know, when, when we had to go get permission from the master Custis to go into town, we had to get, uh, that we needed some spending money that he was, uh, would always, uh, always granted and, and give us even more than we, we had asked for. And, you know, the, you raise a good question about the interviews with enslaved people. And there are, there's some from uh, about 1930 to the uh, descend, uh, the daughters of the enslaved women came to Arlington House and were interviewed and they, they have a summary of it, who, who recalled the years of slavery. You don't find in these interviews, the bitterness that you might expect in modern times, you would say, well, what about the abolitionists or what about the militants and the runaways and, uh, and uh, the um, uh, Nat Turner's rebellion, you know, these uh, and slave revolts. Yes, all that happened too. But the people who are giving interviews that we have on the record, the exception of course is Nat Turner. He gave a jailhouse interview, which he described his whole plot to, to, to kill the slave owners. But the, the interviews that, I've been able to find of enslaved people, enslaved under Custis, uh, was that they were uh, grateful and loyal. And it's, it's hard in modern times for people to understand that, I think. Uh, it, it's worthy of more of research because it's possible that they're, you know, that they're not being honest, but we just can't know that, so. Uh, Jody Goulden uh, asked, did the freed slaves stay on and work at, at Arlington House? Did they continue to stay there or did they move on? Well, a lot of them uh, went to Freeman's Village there on the same property. And uh, that's where you get the Syfax connection there. Um, and uh, let's see, the most notable example um, would be James Parks, the one who stayed there and became an employee of the US Army and, and died, he lived as late as 1929. Uh, Mary Syphax's property was confiscated by the Union Army during the, war, war, uh, the Civil War, but was returned to her by Act of Congress after the Civil War in 1866. Uh, what in effect, uh, so in effect, there was no need for reparations of the property. That's from Gary Laporte. Yes, uh, G Jerry's right. Jerry, yeah. Jerry, that, that, sorry, that's Jerry. in my book, too, that there was an Act of Congress to recognize uh, Mariah Syphax and her family as the owners of that 17 acres. And uh, uh, it, it's interesting that uh, the Syfax land was uh, a, a streetcar stop in the uh, 19-teens or 20s. Or so so the, the Syfaxes have been known in, in Arlington County. You can see that name on a map for the earlier part of the 20th century. But Jerry's right, and that, that is in, in my book. Uh, Karen Con Conair, um, um, asked the question, why was Custis raised by his grandparents instead of his mother as he was still as she was still living at the death of her after yes. the death of her husband? Right? There uh, were four uh, children, right? Two another, ex grand. another excellent question that, that comes up. So uh, Eleanor Calvert Custis gave birth something like 22 times in her life. And a lot of those were uh, miscarriages. But she, after she has four children with Jackie Custis and he dies, she remarries David Stewart in, in 1783 and they proceed 
to have you know more than a dozen more uh but not, not all live and so the, the the feeling is that george and martha were lonely and wanted young people out at mount vernon that's that's one theory and the other is that the elder children eliza and martha were in a different stage of life and approaching their adolescence and so you got nelly and washi who are ages i guess one and, and four or so i have to look that up uh that they were uh easier for martha and george washington out of mount vernon to, to handle so that's that, those are the two theories on that uh, Dave Kavanaugh asks, "What about whereabouts? It was the Freedom Freedom Freedman's Village. Where where exactly was it on, on the grounds?" Well, it's part of Arlington Cemetery today. There there are maps that almost show it. Uh, you know, just look, think of uh, think of the Sheraton Hotel and think of uh, that where the Navy Annex was until it was torn down. Uh, about 15 years ago, I guess. Uh, it, it, it's, it's all in there somewhere. There, there are maps. Uh, if you go on the Black Heritage Museum of Arlington, which uh, they helped me with my research too, they have a website. They have a map of Freeman's Village there. Uh, just to harken back to uh, Custis's views on freeing slaves or not freeing slaves, um, were, were his... Uh, his uh, thoughts uh, representative of the age, you know, people struggled with it and, but it was economic and, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, so this is a very important question, I think, for modern people to understand because it's frustrating that, you know, there's a saying that uh, the past is a foreign country. Uh, they do things differently there, you know. So when you take modern values and say, well, why weren't these people, you know, more woke back, back then? But, so abolitionism gets started in the in the mid 18th century. I mean, there are churches and, and nonprofits and some government officials in England and in the uh, colonies were thought that slavery was immoral and the slave trade ought to be stopped. And eventually the slave trade stopped early and by the Brits, uh, I think it's 1807 or eight. So uh, abolitionism exists and it's debated, uh, the slavery question is debated at the Continental Congress, of course, in 1787. So the idea that slavery is wrong is not a foreign concept. However, if you look at the, the differences uh, in the economies in the North and South, which gets accentuated when cotton takes over from uh, tobacco as a plot, as a crop, uh, and there, there are different markets, and, um, and you look at the politicians who can get elected, that's a key. So, how, so if you ran on an abolitionist ticket, uh, how, how soon in American history could you get elected? Keeping in mind that there may be Northern politicians who don't own slaves, but they uh, are trying to make nice political alliances with their Southern party mates or whatever. So uh, it, gets, it gets pretty tricky about when, you know, you get into the uh, Nebraska and the Missouri Compromise of 1850. And I mean, it, it gets very tricky regionally about when uh, anti-slavery becomes mainstream so and the last question is what's your next book well it's not nice uh as we mentioned earlier uh because of the pandemic i published two books at once which i don't recommend to authors but uh my other book is more modern uh, uh history of arlington with preservation and nostalgia it's called lost arlington county and then uh, right now I'm working on uh, something a little more personal uh, memoir, which I'll discuss at some, uh, in the future, so. Well, that's a little teaser, isn't it, for everybody? <laughs> there you go, that's, yeah. leave, them, leave them wanting more. So, uh, well, the, Charlie, this is just great. Obviously, there's a lot of people interested in your work and uh, um, I'm an Alexandrian, so I, I appreciated your work as well. well We're talking about uh, Orinoco Street and, and, and all of that, so. Uh, so thank you very much. All right. Um, My pleasure, folks. Uh, really, thank you.